Hi. Brenda earned her bachelor's degree <coughs> excuse me, in fine arts and history from the University of Oklahoma, attended graduate school at the Ryukyu's University in Okinawa, and completed a master's degree at the University of Oklahoma. She has taught drawing, painting, and Okinawan cultural history for the University of Maryland's Far East Division, and also at San Antonio College. And her artwork has been displayed in many museums, galleries, corporate collections all around the world. She's included in many museums' permanent collections. Brenda is also the founder of an organization called Threads of Blessing International, which teaches um, textile art and design to women in developing <coughs> countries, excuse me. And she has served on the board of the American Institute of, um, the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe. She was also named the Dynamic Woman of the Year for the Chickasaw Nation in 2017. And we're, re we're really honored to be presenting Brenda's work here on Cape Cod and to our New England community. Um, it's going to be a revelation for a lot of us <laughs> here. We haven't seen her work. Um, and also, I'd like to introduce Heather Lunsford, who is uh, a mixed media artist herself, actually, who studied watercolor painting and art history at Oklahoma State University and also at Northern Illinois University. She received her Master's of Arts in Administration from the University of the Incarnate Word, Word excuse me, in San Antonio, and she now serves as chair of the Studio Art and Design and Design uh, Department and also she's the director of the Nona Jean Pulsey Gallery at Oklahoma City University. So we're so thrilled to have Brenda here from San Antonio and Heather here from Oklahoma City. So um, uh, today um, they're gonna talk about Brenda's work. So please, uh, let's welcome <laughs> Brenda. So it's a little unusual that I talk about a show I curated with the artist sitting next to me. <laughs> so I had to think a little bit about that um, and how I was going to do that. So, and Brenda and I have an unusual relationship because we've been doing this shtick together for what, about four years? Mm -hmm. So I first curated this show, I'd say we've been in conversation for maybe five years now. Mm -hmm because when I moved from San Antonio to Oklahoma City, I was actually the director of public art for the state of Oklahoma. And I started working on a project to bring some art to the state capital of Oklahoma, and we actually had no abstract artwork. And I thought that was a real fall down of the collection, and so I started researching abstract pieces. And uh, I'm looking at this, this native woman and she's so interesting online and I'm like gosh this woman is in San Antonio and she looks really familiar and then I realized like oh she went to my church <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I I call one of my friends and she's like oh do you want Brenda's phone number and so I call her and then I go down there because I've now sold my house that is two blocks away from her house in San Antonio and we have coffee and we really like each other. And although that never came to fruition, <laughs> I'm now uh, at the university and I'm, I'm working there. And um, hello to my boss's mother who's sitting over here in the orange, you know, the orange dress. <laughs> oh, the small world, the, my point of the small world. But um, I, I call Brenda and I say, you need to have a show in Oklahoma. So Brenda, although being from Oklahoma, had never had an art show in Oklahoma. So we start working on this show that we're gonna do, and I'm determined that her artwork is gonna come back to Oklahoma, so I start a conversation with the, the Chickasaw Nation. Because although I'm from Oklahoma, I am not Native American, and so they give me a young anthropologist who is recently graduated from Stanford, so I definitely wanna mention Emily Santanum, as the, um, she helped me do some of the didactical writing. Didactic is a fancy word for the stuff that goes on the walls. And uh, she was really amazing. So we flew to San Antonio, we interviewed Brenda together, uh, I picked out all the paintings and Emily did it. We did several days of interviews and it was really great. 
So what I want to talk about today is what happens when somebody decides to curate an art show and why they pick out the work that they do and what that means and, and, and kind of what's behind why what I picked and why Brenda's work was interesting to me to curate and then talk about kind of what we talked about and why we picked out some of the things. So when I'm picking work uh, m normally, unless I'm sort of forced to curate a show, which let's, as a curator, I think we all admit that sometimes those things happen. Um, whether we met, admit them out loud or when the door is closed is, is you know, sometimes the answer. But this is a show I wanted to curate. I think that's important to say because the work is good and beautiful. And I think we can all look at it and say, you know, maybe you like one painting more than another. And that's what Brenda and I were sitting here saying, like, well, we like that one more than that one and why and talking about why we like it. Um, so yes, the work is beautiful, it's interesting, it has rhythm, it has color, it's, it's different than things I've seen before, and that's something as a curator I really look for. Um, and especially in, in native artwork, there's sometimes a trend of things to be stereotypical, and, and, and that's not very interesting to me always. So what I love about Brenda's work is that it is clearly native but it's not what you would say oh that's a native artwork so that's really interesting but then for me as someone who studied contemporary art history and also watercolor painting there's some deeper themes that i want to talk to you guys about that i don't even think maybe brenda knows that i think about her work so what i'm gonna do for about the next 20 minutes is i'm going to talk about the sort of art history background, and I think you guys can probably see this, I don't know if we need to turn the lights down, um, take you guys on a little journey from maybe like 1880 to 1939, something that's really, really important in the journey of the art world, and hopefully it won't get too boring. I, I know a lot of people suffered through art history in college and maybe didn't enjoy it, so I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, so 1880, the world really starts to change you know modernization is starting to happen things are industrial revolution is happening the world is is greatly greatly changing and so europe is being flooded by a ton of different art styles and they're very loosely grouped around one big world called modernism and and essentially each modernist reacts one of two ways they either really adhere to the previous generation or they react against it and both both of which are really important so what we see here is a really a really really important moment in 1903 and so in 1903 to 1905 there were a couple of painters in paris and and they were Andre Durain is this one, and he was hanging out with Henri Matisse, and they had an art show in the, in the big uh, glass building together, and an art critic comes, and he writes a scathing, I'm sure it wasn't like we think of scathing, but I'm sure it was in beautiful French words and very funny to us now. He writes a scathing review of them, t telling them they were horrible, and he calls them wild beasts, which in French is the fauves and that becomes their names. And he called them wild and out of control because of the colors that they used, right? So clearly they were out of control because a, a tree cannot be orange, that that's completely inappropriate. And a bush cannot be that color and the grass must be green. So what they were doing was out of control. But what was really happening here that is incredibly important is that this is the first time we really see in modern art, in art, color being released from reality. So before, painters were, were painting what they saw. Well, right now, 1903 to 1905, that's not happening anymore. Painters are starting to paint what they want. And so this is a really pivotal moment in art history that we, that we credit. And so here's one of his, his partners. So this is slightly later, also another Frenchman, um, Henri Matisse. So the same thing, They're, these dancers are sort of floating out there. We can definitely see that they're, they're humanoid, they're people, but they're not, they're not really real. 
Um, they're kind of representational, but, but not exactly. So we see a sort of further pushing of a, a lessening of reality because there's another invention in modernism that is really, really happening here. I'm not sure if anybody might know what that is, but the camera. The camera has been invented now. So people don't need to pay that portrait painter to paint their family very unhappily smiling like the mothers, you know, pinching the back of their arms at mass to be quiet. You know, uh, it was the, what was the name of the camera? So in 1888, the Kodak number one was accessible to the upper class consumer. But in 1900, the Kodak Brownie was fully accessible to the middle class. So they didn't need to have a painter paint their portrait. So artists really didn't have to be that fully representational moment for the public anymore. They could kind of paint what they wanted. But this is really shocking, where this doesn't feel shocking to us now. This was very, very shocking in 1910 to the public. So take it a few years more. And in leading up to World War I, we have Vasily Kandinsky, a Russian painter, but he becomes French later. So this is clearly more abstracted, but to Kandinsky, this wasn't abstracted. This was a complete visual language. He actually wrote what I would call a manifesto on this, uh, an entire book. He thought that you could translate this into musical notes, that you could actually read this and play music from it. He thought the color blue was God. So another interesting note to this, we can talk about that in a minute. Um, and the, this was a very intentional creation. There was nothing sort of haphazard about the creation of this. Um, it was very well planned, and if you could see Kandinsky and his buddies hanging out in cafes in Paris, they would be all fully suited, extremely proper, drinking you know, coffee out of little tiny cups. They would look like what we would think of old-fashioned bankers, but yet they were the extreme height of avant-garde modern art. Uh, this was controversial, people hated it. Um, <laughs> and it was really pushing boundaries because this isn't a tree, it's not a landscape, you know, I don't even know what it is. So here we see a full breaking down of form into a complete abstraction. And in the, war, in the years leading up to World War II, artists are now starting to want to escape Europe. They are escaping Hitler. They, um, this kind of art is considered um, inappropriate in the Reich, and artists are starting to either flock to Paris or to move to the United States, because art in, in the United States is still completely dominated by realism. There's really very, very few painters that are showing abstract art. We see Lee Krasner, who is a woman, um, but there are very, very, very few women, in the, very few people at all in the United States showing any what I would call um, abstract art. But we'll see Lee Krasner, and the reason I put her work up here because in the United States, something very, very, very important happened. Um, World War II happens, art in Europe, um, Many artists flock to the United States, and then the United States has something called the Works Progress Administration. So I think all of us probably know that because they built a lot of roads and bridges, but what they also did was something called the Federal Art Program, and they did, I think everybody maybe remembers the post office where they did the murals. Well, they funded thousands of artists, they gave them salaries, they had them, gave them health care, and so those moments that artists were able to feed themselves, that they were also able to hang out in Greenwich Village 
and congregate and sit around and talk about ideas. Well, this was a, a study for a mural that Lee Krasnar proposed. I don't think it was ever, it was abstract, so I believe it not to ever have been uh, painted. But um, they created, they sat around and talked a lot and they created a lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts and they discussed what is modernism, what is American art. And something really important happened in those moments. All those artists coming in from Europe and our government letting people uh, have the resources to be artists created a group of artists in America called the Abstract Expressionists. And it cannot be understated this moment in art history. Uh, I say to my students all the time that if, there, if it hadn't been for Madonna, there would be no Britney Spears. And if it wasn't for Britney Spears, there would be no uh, whatever the girl is that's on the radio all the time at the moment that they're all screaming Olivia something or other. Um, and they all, they all have her, and I say, yeah, 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 but you have to understand what I mean. Um, that everything comes from something. And that they have to understand that. Because they would say, oh, I don't believe that. And I say, no. If it wasn't for Madonna breaking through those barriers, and Madonna was having an affair with Basquiat, and who was running around with the factory. You know, everything is really tied together. And it's really important to recognize those really pivotal moments. Jackson Pollock, I mean, I put this photo of him on there. If you can see him, because he was actually Lee Krasner's husband. Um, when he died, he might have had two girls sitting in his convertible that weren't Lee Krasner, but that's, you know, eh, sorry. But this painting is called Yellow Islands. I, I can't see an island anywhere in there. So not only now have American painters been completely freed from any representational form, they don't have to they can title a painting Yellow Island, and there doesn't have to be an island in there, and nobody cares. I don't even know that there's any yellow in this painting. There might be a couple of spots, but he doesn't have to say if there's yellow, because um, it doesn't matter. But not only has he done that, he has freed the idea of even using a canvas or a paintbrush. You can pour paint, you can splatter paint, you can throw paint. You can do whatever you want and it's legitimate and whatever. I mean, he was probably throwing paint and splattering it so he could hold a cigarette and a bourbon to make it easier. I mean, there was probably a reason to do that because he had uh, quite the repu rep, you know, reputation to uphold. But this moment cannot be understated in American art history, the, the, the freedom that other painters felt after this. It was just extremely pivotal. And that takes us on to where I think is really, really important in the 1950s. It brings us into color field painting, where we really start to see women having shows, women and, and the invention of the joy of acrylic painting, thin acrylic painting, washed acrylic painting, and it brings us to a woman who I love named Helen Frankenthaler. So Helen Frankenthaler thinned down acrylic paint, which is a technique we're gonna see in Brenda's paintings. She did multiple washes. Washing is a technique that is heavily seen in Brenda's work. Um, acrylic paint, uh, you know, before, Back in, you know, before the invention of acrylics in like the 1940s and 50s, we had oil painting and watercolor painting, and that was kind of all they taught and that was all they had. Did you even learn acrylic painting in school? Uh, we had gouache. Yeah, so, yeah, no. And they didn't even have acrylic painting when I went to school mm -hmm. in the 90s. Like, we didn't teach that. So acrylic painting is like a new thing. So it was, it, but, you know, it was sort of invented to like save us all, and it kind of didn't. I don't know. And it was, so this is a new revolutionary thing. Anyway, so she, we see a real resurgence of, uh, and this is, you know, and it's still, it's, she's an incredible woman, but my point in showing you all of these slides is to show you, just to tell you like how I think about Brenda in the, 
in the greater context because when I look at these paintings, you know, I see I see the you know the the breakdown of shapes that come from Vasily Kandinsky and the rhythm and, and the abstraction of form and how all of those lines, you know, Kandinsky was super interested in the spiritualism. You know, he was really into Freud and what did all of that mean? Can we, I, will this play on here? Let's see if this, this video will play for us. So we talk, we look at Brenda's um, influences. I don't know if this video will play. No, nah, it won't. I didn't think about it. It'll play on the computer. It's the video that's right over there. So hopefully you guys will all watch. Well, can you can you hear it though? Yeah, a little bit. We can just talk. We'll talk about it. It's okay. It's okay. It'll be real quiet. So when I met Brenda, and you already heard her bio, she was really interested in. I'm not sure if any of you guys have ever been to like a Native American powwow and some of those things. So if you see a lot of the imagery is repeated, but it is very much sort of broken down and digested through the lens of abstraction in some paintings more than others. Some of the earlier ones, but they're not just native paintings. You know, Brenda's travels, you can see that she's been to some African countries. There's, there's sort of a love of culture and travel and you can see, what country, was that Kenya over there? Uh, well, early on I thought I was gonna go to Africa and this was Maasai, I met mm -hmm. a Maasai uh, fellow and his wife. We took them to, uh, in Texas, we took them on a ride and they sang songs to me and I thought I really wanna go so I did a painting of Maasai and then about three years later we started this work with Threads of Blessing which meant uh, I got to actually go for years. It's still on. I think we have in Uganda now uh, nine provinces, 14 provinces now of women working. So I, this was like a preliminary prayer almost of what I thought I would like to do in life and actually got to do it. And so the women are all textile artists, or at least that was what we were encouraging them to become. So that painting is, is really Maasai, but my whole work was Uganda. That piece, you wanna ask about? No, well, I'm with you, pal. Well, so I think what is so fascinating to me about the work is, I mean, so the work is, I would say this is like a mini retrospective. Mm -hmm. So retrospective is, is a, you know, a snapshot of an artist's work over a period of time. So mm -hmm. we have probably mid '90s over there mm -hmm. to some pretty contempt nowadays work. Now. Some of these are very, you know, very yeah. contemporary. Yeah. Um, you know, and they represent sort of moments in an artist's mm -hmm. life, and that's mm -hmm. why some of them are quite different because they're painted in different moments right. in your life and right. in different things you're experiencing and in different places that you've traveled. And, and what I love about them is that you, you know, you, you sort of have absorbed that culture and you've lived there and then you've, and you can, let me go forward. And so here you are oh, yeah. living, when you're living in Japan and you can see, you know, some of like the ones at the back are, there's definitely more Asian influences in those, just the shapes. Well, I sent Sarah a letter because I got inspired again by Okinawa. That was a place that my husband was a pilot. So we were stationed in Okinawa. And uh, everyone laughed at us and said, it's the rock and how, what will you do on this little tiny island? And the minute we landed, I, I belonged there. And we lived on a Kakazu mountain, which was, uh, the main line of the Shuri Defensive during World War II, and it was off limits to Americans. We didn't know, so, and my husband didn't rank enough for us to live anywhere else, and I sold a painting in California so that we could buy a $3,000 house. And so Okinawa, we were there almost seven years off and on, and the, the beauty of it was I got to live with the Okinawans, 
And so I learned the language and I learned uh, the culture and worked with potters and weavers. And so the one right, um, I'm sitting here smiling at this piece, is I wrote my master's thesis on the story of the Okinawans. And I could go on forever talking to you about this, but all the different, those representations of different textiles and different kinds of weavings. And it's an abstraction, but again, it isn't. And I took those stories from the 1300s and the different traditions on the ocean that the Okinawans were traveling on. And so all of these stories, all of these are stories, and, and Native Americans are storytellers. So we always have all these connections in us, and we told stories because we weren't writing things down. And so that was my tradition to tell you my stories. And uh, that's what that one is. Mm -hmm. uh, Tahana, see, I can give you lots of detail, but the, the little red pieces up at the top there are little hand-sewn red threads that are over another weaving. And the basho is the, the banana fiber that they used during the 1300s. And the blue is indigo, it's a dye. On the other hand, it's the ocean, because the ocean was everywhere around us. You know, it's 13 miles. And you'd think, what do you do on 13 miles? And there was everything there. The, the life was the fullest I've ever imagined. And so I have a lot of positive to say. OK. Well, and then, you know, for example, this, so for me, the paintings are very much broken up into, I can recognize them by color stories okay. because they change for me based on color stories. So this one is more like where I'm from. Yes. And I can tell that by the color palette because this looks like the colors of Oklahoma. So oh, do you yeah. want to mention that? Yeah, she's leading me so well. <laughs> <laughs> This is a contemporary piece, and you know, you go through, a painter goes through series according to where their life is and what they want to, and so there is all sorts of series in here. And this one is a contemporary late series that I did when I just thought, I just want to let go and just do some painting and have fun with it. And every time I do that, there's some connection with the colors of Oklahoma. I have to tell you, Oklahoma is, are these colors, and I grew up with my husband that's a wheat farmer. So it's wheat to me, and it's natural pieces of uh, Oklahoma. There's Indian references in there, but there's also a lot of just those are the weaving colors that I would have done in that era of my life. Uh, Brenda, how many, so a wash is a, is a word we use in painting. So flat, pattern, wash. It's where you thin out the paint and you wash it across. How many washes would you say a work like that has mm -hmm. in it? Well, um, yes, that's part of the technique. And I learned it in Okinawa. There's a sumie, which is an Indian, uh, India ink painting. Let's see if I can get this to play. And that's just a wash of color, uh, just black and white. And I did that for Here years with a master. Oh, yes. Well, it's, I, don't, I don't know if it's going to play for us. It may not let us play. But anyway, so I learned to do those washes. And then all the lines are all hand done. Mm -hmm. This is all hand done. There's no magic markers or there's no masking tape or anything. This is all. So it's like a weaving for me. But in that, there may be 25, 35 layers for me. And then eventually on the, the opaque pieces, that are in the painting, those may take, the reds always take me seven or eight layers. So I'm doing over and over and over to get an opaqueness. The opaqueness has to do with my grandmother, my Chickasaw grandmother, in Bay Cone. She was a Bay Cone house mother at an Indian college. And she was the cook for the boys. And she would bake them bread. Well, Bay Cone artists, there were a lot of Kiowas there. See, I can go on a long story there, and I won't, can't do it today, but the Kiowas did a flat painting. They did not do, and so you see I'm breaking barriers, but going back to tradition. And so those flat pieces, some people say, well, 
Why did she do that? It's because I intentionally did it to recognize the history back from my family. So there's flat pieces, and those are the ones that take seven, eight, ten layers. So. And this one has more flat parts, where some of them are a little more washy. And as a painter myself, that's something that's very interesting to me. Because I think if you look at like a retrospective, when you get, it's really interesting to see a retrospective because you get to see years of, you know, it's not, that's not one representation of a painter. But if you look at like, for example, the yeah. distinction between that that has fuzzy parts in it and the tightness of that painting, there's such a contrast that it's very interesting because I think when you when you look, there's you know, there's a tightening and a loosening. So you get to see a lot of the skill that you have, Brenda, that is really interesting. That you're able to complete something like that, but you're also able to execute something like that. So that's a really interesting you can see all the levels of painterly skill that you have. Well, that's because if I'm painting this one, these are two liturgical pieces. And this one was about removal, which is the theme of most of my work is about removals. And so this is, the, uh, but this one is Chaldean Zavur, and that was early biblical to my way of thinking, uh, an intelligent community and the Chaldeans. I love this, uh, this beginning of culture and how in this one it's telling you stories about how cultures collapse no matter how brilliant and talented and wonderful, there's collapse, there's chaos within it. And yet within that, there's always remnants. And there's remnants in these pieces, which I call seeds. And you'll see in there little bright pieces of seeds. Those are the people that are buried for a while, in a way. And yet they're very much alive and they're trying to keep their culture. And so those little seeds are bright. And eventually they're fed to come back up and they come alive again. So cultures, I'm interested in how we keep our cultures and how we keep our languages and how we continue. And so there's always remnants. So this is the actual angst of the removal and this is the continual slow progression of life as it goes along. However, doing this piece is hard and technical and I'm tight and I'm doing 17 layers and 45 layers. This one, I'm so tired of being tight that I go into this and go, let her rip, and just go for it. And so they're both stories, but they're just told to you a different way. Let's also talk about the, something that um, you and then other painters we talked about today, like Kandinsky, and, and something that is a theme throughout many years in historical painting, the color blue and how that often represents spirituality and you can see it and I think in this work and mm -hmm. what that means to you and, and your spirituality and your thoughts on God and, and your spirituality. Well, two things I have to say. If you mention Kandinsky, I have a gallery in Paris that I've been in for 10 years or so and his mother worked with Kandinsky. So they were so excited. That's one of the reasons they like this work. And so we've been very close friends for a very long time. And they said to tell everyone hello. They wanted to be here. But they have an opening in Paris. And so my work is going on there too. And then the blue is usually my blessing. Uh, there's usually a blue in all of these pieces. And those are blessing signs for you. And they're prayer work. They're usually my prayers. So I put put blue in somewhere in nearly all of the pieces I can see, yeah. So that's what that's about. So those are my prayer, prayer words. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Can you speak to the seven blessings in there? Because what comes to mind is that they're doing a Jewish wedding ceremony. There are seven blessings. That's pretty. I like that. Well, yes, I can. The seven blessings of our family. And a lot of times in a powwow, you're standing there, and the, in the original part of it, the beginning of the processions, all the tribes are, march, are dancing out. And so that's, that's very, very traditional and beautiful. And then when the dances start and the competition starts, 
there's a lot of movement that's going on all the time. So you don't have, uh, in some paintings that I've seen of first people, they're st static or imaginative, but they're not moving. And all of those regalias are not inspired. Uh, so these are the seven blessings or seven different people moving in dance. So the blessings are the, the different tribes? Yes, different people blessings. Because regalia is very loud. I don't, I it's, mean. Oh, yes. I don't know. Has anybody ever been to a powwow? You remember it's all the very bells loud. and the drums and the things that are going on? That's all so moving. And uh, you don't see that in a lot of interpretations of early Americans. And we're not so early, we're still here. And so we need to be more contemporary. We need to be with this time too. So you, so it's a dichotomy. I'm on the board of the Institute of American Indians and, and I'm with students all the time. And these students have this dichotomy of being contemporary young and full of energy and they want to do pop things and wonderful art. And they also are angry because they're tired of being interpreted as standing with, a, with feathers. Like the Chickasaws don't wear feathers at all. And so when I paint, you know, I don't want to do regalia as for particular tribal affiliation. There are 650 tribes. How could I possibly be honest to 650 different interpretations? So that's, does that answer it at all? Kind of. Yeah. No, it's just seven. It's just seven people. Okay. I have a question about your technique. By the way, welcome and thank you. Your works are for beautiful. And um, I see, um, you know, Sumi painting, I associate more with paper uh -huh. um, and ink. What, did you begin on paper or did, have you always painted on canvas? And do you do anything special to accept the wash on the canvas if you're painting very thin? Uh, I don't do anything special to the canvas. Sometimes the canvas does special things to me. I wish I had the painting to show you. <laughs> I bought this big piece and started my wash on it and somehow it connected paint and there are all these black dots and it's the paintings hanging in my living room because it took me forever to do and I had to incorporate the black dots because they wouldn't go away. Now, on the paper pieces, I'm wor I work on paper a lot. Oh, I should have said that. We, we only shipped canvas pieces because the glazed pieces were heavier and they cost more money. I should just say that yeah. too, for safety and cost. A lot. Yes. <laughs> Arches. Arches. 300 pound. And that floats beautifully. And I work on a drafting table flat. I have a big sheet of mace oh well it's four by eight and i i work flat standing up i used to work on the floor which you would do as sumier but i'm too old and my knees are too terrible so now i stand up and my back is terrible so <laughs> there's no excuse though so the paper pieces i love and i used to do large roll pieces of paper but the 30 by 40s are gorgeous and the, work, the, the washes settle in. Do hot press paper? Hot press. That's what I do. I'm a hot, hot press paper. And then you, it's real smooth. You like yeah. you roll it. The, yeah. And the preparation for the canvases are only that I go in and just take my hands over the canvas and just do this over and over and over. And, and it's almost like petting a horse. You know, you're just getting used to the pieces. And then you just let that wash from that there's no nothing here is preconceived nothing is ahead of time and i'm not saying today i'm going to do this except the maasai that may be the only preconceived piece in the whole exhibit but that's so much tighter brenda that pe these pieces for me are those two in the back corner yeah are so much tighter where i think these are so much more instinctual that's right. You know, the, That's right. the mature, like these are, I mean, 
these show where you're at now and those are so much more formative so yeah. but i felt like putting this show together i had to show those because those those showed the cultural beginnings of where brenda was really absorbing all these culturals she was such a traveler and you know i felt like she was you know in a market in and she was working with these women and helping them and she would get a scar for a textile and she would and then she would have to paint it right or she would see something and so those are so much more literal yeah. And then you can see where it really starts to, my favorite piece is, is this one. We've been sitting here talking about this one. Um, and, but these are just so, you know, they're, they're just so different. And, and these, I, I mean, I really think you've reached the, the height of excellence here. And it's the negative space, it's the color for me, it's, it's the lilac in these, you know, the the rhythm in them, the negative space is so interesting. Um, I feel like you can see the, you know, the vertical lines of the staffs and the poles and the dance. You know, Brenda's work has always been something, if you read any of the didactical writings from any curators that have worked with her, they talk a lot about the, um, the regalia not only of the native cultures that she's in, been influenced by but you know uh, also seeing the, the Japanese dresses and how they always carry staffs and poles you can definitely see that imagery moving through it so I feel like that is you know it carries a consistent theme and motif through all of these works where it's going is this one back here and that's Tupelo we had a show, the Chickasaws had a show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Mississippi. And I had never been to Homelands, and the Homelands for Chickasaws is, oh, my grandfather was 1730. And so going back to Tupelo, to the mounds, uh, nine of us, I think, got in cars and drove to Tupelo, Mississippi. What's there, you know? And we got out and we walked on these farm roads and we found these wonderful mounds, which are the original burial sites or sites where uh, buried tr uh, trash, that I call them treasure mounds, were. And that was for the Chickasaws. By the way, they were there uh, in 1540. So this is old, old fields to us, and that's the name of some of it. And when we went back, it was a very amazing experience. A lot of them, I was an elder, I'm already an elder, so there were a lot of younger artists with me and it was inspiring to see that it hit us all really hard. It really hit us to go back and see uh, where our family started. And so we decided to do something about it. And then pandemic hit and all of us were stuck at home and some people complained and I've considered, it sounds terrible, I, forgive me, but it was such a peaceful thing to stay home and to not perform and I could paint all day in my pajamas with my coffee. And so I worked very hard and have done nine pieces and this is just one of them about Tupelo and when we stood there we watched, we were in these swamps and it was the first time I got to think what it was like for my families to walk through those swamps, how they were pushed out of their homes. And that was the removal again. And so I had already been painting removal and I respected Okinawa and I respected the early times for removal. And all of a sudden I was standing in a place and I really got a view of what I thought, I can't imagine me, I wish my daughter was sitting here. And I would tell her, I can't imagine carrying her through those swamps. How could that be possible? And how could you lose your culture, your home, your language, everything that was you? How could you recover all of that? And that's what this whole series is about. So it's a happy thing, because we did recover. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Any more questions? I have a question. Oh. How do you um, determine 
this is it, I'm finished with this piece. I mean, I, I'm fascinated. I mean, you 30 mm -hmm. watches or whatever. Um, a hard question. And I am not an art connoisseur at all. Yeah. Really, very um, novice. But you look at this and you say, all right, it's done. It is finished. How do you design? I have a. I have a girlfriend, she's Creek Muskokian, and she just got a fellowship, she, uh, uh, Fulbright, to teach in Ireland, and she's teaching, and she calls me on the phone and we talk history all the time. And she'll say, what are you painting? And I'll say, I'm painting something and I'm mad at it. I can't finish it. It will not let me go. And it makes me so mad because then I get frustrated and then I go down and I say, I quit. I just hate this. And then, then I have to stop for a day or two and quit and come back to it. And what it usually means is I'm too tired or I'm too stressed or something is keeping me. And so the painting just waits patiently on me and then I'll go back clean and finish it. Sometimes though, that one. Sometimes I just am a really, a painting goes smoothly, and when it's finished, I go, oh, wait a minute, I'm not through yet. It's like a good book. Mm -hmm. You know, a really good book when you're reading and you're sorry that it's over? Mm -hmm. Some of them are like that, and those are kind of rare. Do you turn it to the wall and don't look at it? I do that sometimes. I have one on the wall right now. Yeah. And uh, I've learned that sometimes you just have to Put it away. Let go of Let it. Let go. Sometimes I'll turn it away and not look at it for a while and come back to it. Because you just have to stop looking at it and then look at it again. And then you can see it better. Yeah. And sometimes every day you go in, I, I carry those images in my head all the time. Mm -hmm. So I'll be doing something entirely else, and, but I'll be painting. So that's how I memorize. All, I can tell you all this because it's always here. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to let go of them. I, the other thing I, I love the quote that's up there on the wall. Yeah. Um, it, that we all come back again and <coughs> they rise, they continue to survive. I mean, I love that image, that quote, but also what you said here. Mm -hmm. about. It's the other true. thing is, I think this, I, I love this painting. Now, you say Thank it really, you. It was rage for you, and it was anger, and it was letting go. And, to me, it's happy. <laughs> I think it's the colors. And I, I see, you know, a turtle in there. I, mean, I see so many different things that you... That no, you it's know. not rage. It's, because um, when I did it, I, had, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and when I finished, I was, it was, when I finished, it was the chaos of removal. I don't know that there was rage. I think it's more chaos. Because I think when you're the one getting moved, you're kind of confused. Mm -hmm. There's those places there of just, what's going on? We're moving, pick up your pieces. Uh, oh, don't step there. And there's all of that in that. It's a looseness in it. There is some rage in there too, you're right. There's a little eye looking. There's some rage. There's some angst in that. There's some. You got the blue. I got the blue in there. The blue's there. But you also said that it's the release from the tightness. Always. Yes. Yes. That's a release. That's the same thing. Yeah, you're right. I'm glad you're asking me questions. It's much easier than me trying to tell you something. I think that's it. No, no more. Oh. Things, I, something I've seen in some of them, they look like circles. It's yeah, nice. yeah. Are those all the things? Those are different things. Those are, um, I did a, another painting when I was in, when I go to Honduras, it's, wild and full of trees. It's the prettiest country. And it makes me so sad it's in so much trouble. The yes. women in Honduras, mm -hmm. I go there with the women, I work with women in several provinces. And uh, we were traveling through the mountains through the coffee plantations and build, 
and I did this one painting and all the little circles are daydreams and you just brought it up. There are little things going on in my head, little brain things going off, which are upstairs, by the way, in the basket, people. That thrilled me because I identified with that and I thought, I know what that is when your imagination is just going off. So those are little ideas popping around. Now, on the other hand, sometimes they're heads, they're Indian faces. Sometimes they're the conch belts, they're the pieces of belts in the pieces. I don't know if any are here in belts. But sometimes they're different images, and sometimes they're just little tiny awakening pieces. Thanks for asking. Those are my favorite things to do.